Okay. Okay, back to the subject to hand. So, welcome to session eighty-two. Uh, sorry, we're getting a late start today, but we'll we'll catch right up. We've got two outstanding speakers on getting it right with E-rate today. There's a lot of rulings pending and comment deadlines approaching, and that uh, have well, it's a lot of opportunity, but it's a lot of demand. And we're going to hear hear about this from Bob and Deb shortly. Deb, Deborah, sorry about the redundancy. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network, long-standing uh, open consortium of mostly tech-innovating libraries doing interesting, we hope, things, uh, both on the policy front and project-wise. We think those go together, that policy should be informed by experience, and you get experience from doing projects. Our host and uh, is the International Federation of Library Associations, institutions based in The Hague, ifla.org, and at the helm is Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for if our long, long standing partner. Our sponsor, happily, is uh, uh, today is the Institute for Museum and Library Services come in with a uh, helpful uh, support for this uh, series, the uh, libraries in response. We refer to libraries as a Swiss army knife of public institutions. They do more for more people, more services than anybody anybody else by a lot i mean their charter is open and we'll kind of touch on that in related to schools and of course they respond to crises uh, at every scale so crises uh you know we just i mentioned earlier there's been a cascade of crises since the since the pandemic and uh climate is always there ai has come on the scene war has happened so we've got our our kind of composite crises here when the when the world is uh, uh nostalgic for the only thing he was concerned about it was concerned about was thermonuclear annihilation so um uh this is a report that uh, i just saw from imls on all the ways that the pandemic uh, impacted public libraries and that's i'll i'll put that in the chat but it looks like a really good report so e-rate e-rate for education. Education has meant schools in terms of E-rate as subsidy for connectivity to these facilities, uh, where I think some 55 million primary and elementary students uh, attend. Uh, but it's also for libraries who are also considered educational institutions. They are and are not. I mean, they're more than that. So libraries distinctly are, as opposed to schools, which are regimented, have very specific charters about who and what and when and how. Uh, libraries are, are open learning institutions for learners of, of any age at any stage. Uh, learners after school, preschool, homeschool, back to school. Homeschool is is burgeoning it's uh i i think it's it's roughly half the population of charter schools now and it's it's not just religious based it's just people are not happy with public schools in their area and they think they can do as good of a job and they can't afford private schools it's it's just anybody with any circumstances welcome to the library and that creates uh a context for schools, a, a surrounding for schools, a, something that fills out all the needs that schools have that they don't, they themselves don't provide other than the school library if they have one. So uh, very different, uh, very different institutions, very different facilities. Uh, E-Rate has asked and now answered, well, where is a school that, you know, which is a question we ask, well, what is a library if the school, if the library is, if the building is closed? Schools have had to ask the same question. So where is a school? And they've, they've answered it. The FCC has answered that schools are where students are. And they are proceeding to provide connectivity to schools being where students are. Well, okay, how about a library? They've been treated equally. They're identically treated under E-rate. And so where's a library? Where the patrons are? Well, where is that? I, so there's That's... 
a lot of a lot more people than are in in uh, primary and secondary schools, uh, and, but they're more more varied. So more interesting challenges there. So let's get to it. Uh, here we have um, uh, Bob Boker, uh, library technology consultant in Wisconsin, and long time uh, I didn't get it on here. ALA. Uh, go-to man on, on E-rate issues, and Deborah Creedy, chairperson of the state E-rate Coordinators Alliance, and uh, a first-time guest on us. Welcome, Deborah. And Bob is a longtime uh, participant, and welcome back, Bob. Okay. Let me escape here. Let's stop to share. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, are we going Deb first or are we going Bob first? I'll do some introductions here, Deb. Uh, Good. Okay. All right. And Deb, you want to uh, Deb, you want to get the, uh, the the full screen going? I'm trying to. Reason. Yeah. Hang on. Uh, technical. No, I've got it. Wait a minute. I'll I'll get it started that way first, okay. and then do it. It's just easier to do it. Uh, and now I just realized to uh, make the day, my my mouse just conked out. It must be a bad <laughs> battery. I, I've got my pad here, so I'll use the mouse pad, I'll tell you. You know, there was a massive cosmic flare that happened a couple of days ago. Did you read about that? You, you know, anytime you deal with E-rate, that's the problem. Uh, hit that little icon in the lower uh, right corner there, Deb. Which one? Oh, yeah, right next to the slider that shows the size. I was That's just the... gonna I was just gonna do that. Yeah, there okay. We go. we're, we're good. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Here well, we go. Here we go. <laughs> Don, uh, appreciate the introduction. And uh, now that we got all the problems and issues of the world resolved, we can move on from the eat rate perspective. Uh, what we're going to do, as Don briefly mentioned this morning, is provide an update uh, from the E-rate perspective on what's happening in the E-rate world. A lot of things have happened over the last couple of months. Part of that's a result of the FCC now has a full commission. For a while, it was running with just four commissioners and then the chair, Jessica Rosenworcel. And not to get into politics on this, but there were some issues when you have uh, basically two Democrats and two Republicans some of the uh, initiatives that Chair Rosenworcel wanted to push ahead couldn't get put through, if you will, because it wouldn't pass the commission in relationship to the deadlock that it was in. But we now have a full commission. Uh, Anna Gomez was uh, passed by the Senate or approved by the Senate back about two months ago as the last Democratic nominee. And so now the commission is moving full bore uh forward on this so a couple of things that we want to cover this morning in relationship to some of these new developments deb's going to quickly go through the streaming a rate, e -rate uh, further notice of rule making which came out at the end of july she's going to cover that she's also going to cover the wi-fi on buses and while that's not directly pertinent for the most part to libraries because it's primarily a school issue it does have some relationship to libraries that deb will mention as part of that and then both of us will cover uh, i think one of the key uh uh, notices that just came out about a week and a half or two weeks ago, and that's the hotspot program and the loaning of hotspots to patrons and students. And then finally, I'll wind up the program uh, briefly talking about the cybersecurity pilot uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, which just came out a couple of days ago. So, uh, Deb, do you want to uh, take it over here? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, to participate. The streamlining MPRM uh, was announced in the uh, in July. The comment cycles closed already. It had some very nice benefits already announced for tribal and other libraries. You can see there it asks a lot of questions and I'm just going to go through a review of uh, what uh, what the key topics are. Let's see, where are we? There we go. 
I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this because all of these are questions that the FCC asked for comment on, and they were primarily uh, in initiated by uh, the state E-rate coordinators and the American Library Association. So really happy that they're asking for these questions um, in an effort to try to streamline the program to benefit everyone. Uh, there's a number of questions concerning bidding clarifications. Um, in particular, the FCC has a different proposal pending that has been universally uh, reviled, and it is um, for, to establish a national mandatory competitive bidding portal. So what we've done is try to identify other bidding issues that and suggested that if you fix these issues, then you'd have better quality applications and you really would not have a need for this um, national bidding portal. So we've asked for clarifications on how to establish the bidding deadline when the Form 470 is silent on it, suggesting that um, it ought to be the 470 allowable contract date, which is built into the calculation. It's the 20, it's the end of the 28 day uh, bidding period. We've asked for spam bids to be, uh, applicants to be able to be disregarded by the, disregard them because they really aren't truly bids and offers um, to provide services rather than more marketing and uh, promotional materials. We suggested that the RFP requirement that currently governs um, certain uh, services, particularly uh, self-provision service and um, uh, equipment and things like that, that it ought to be rescinded. It's not in the rules and it's no longer necessary that the purchase and the uh, procurement of these services is now well established. It's been going on since 2015, and there's really no need to have this uh, additional regulatory requirement. And then um, with preferred master contracts, this is something that years ago when the FCC modernized uh, the program back in 2014, they said that they were going to have this program where you could be exempt from competitive bidding if you bought off of these uh, master contracts, and that program has never really taken hold. So we've asked them to look at, at doing that. Again, all of these, if adopted, would provide clarity and um, avoid ambiguity and make the process easier for applicants to do their bidding. On eligible services, we asked them to clarify some of these definitional issues that have been very problematic for years. They trip up applicants and cause denials of funding. Very technically oriented, that they don't really clearly explain the boundary with maintenance and something called managed internal broadband services. We've asked them to clarify the boundary there and actually to collapse them into one category. And then all licenses, um, they make a distinction between right to use licenses and software support licenses. We think that they all, all ought to be categorized and treated similarly. Right now there's distinctions. And again, they're very detailed and, uh, and they cause applicants to trip up and ultimately either not get funded, uh, approved funding or not get approved reimbursements. And then last, we've asked for improved um, streamlining of the application process itself. First and foremost, we've asked them to remove altogether um, a form that has to be filed, the third form in the series of forms. After you file your, your bidding form, the 470, and then after you apply for funding, which is the 471, and you get approved, they now require you to file the 486 to basically confirm that you're going to use the funding that you've been approved for. And we, and it also is the form where you have to certify that you're being compliant with the Children's Internet Protection Act. And we think this, those certifications can be moved to the 471 and that you really don't need this form to confirm that you're going to use the funding. So um, that would be one thing. And then the second thing is that there remains confusion over the plain language explanations that are lacking in how to actually do your bidding on the form 470. And again, this confusing language that overlaps, again, causes issues for applicants who mistakenly, um, inadvertently don't choose the right service 
because they just don't understand what they're being asked to select and causes uh, problems when it gets time to file their 471 application. Um, there's another form called the 479, and this is for consortium members when they participate in a consortium and get their internet or their internal connections through the consortium. They have to certify to the consortium lead that they're compliant with CIPA or the Children's Internet Protection Act before you can the uh, lead consortium member can file the 486. So we're hopeful that they actually eliminate the 479 eventually. But for now, what we've said is don't make consortia leads collect this from their members every year. Allow the form to be used as a multiple year form. So instead of having to do it every year, you might be able to do it like for five years. Um, and that would reduce the burden on the consortia um, program participation requirements. And then lastly, the navigation inside the online filing system known as EPIC or the eBay Productivity Center, um, that's that pro, uh, online platform was rolled out about eight years ago and it has um, steadily increased and improved um, in the navigation features, but it's still not where it needs to be. And so um, we've asked the FCC to order USAC to create additional functionality. So that's um, where we stand on those items. And if adopted, they would benefit all applicants, including libraries. Um, it would be primarily beneficial, I think mainly for the small applicants to try to make the program more understandable and um, easier to comply with. So the second item that I'm gonna talk about um, is the school bus Wi-Fi declaratory order. And you're probably wondering, well, my goodness, this is a library uh, webinar. Why, why do I care about this? And it really is because of the overlap of issues that are being addressed in this proceeding and the potential um, uh, applicability to the hotspot um, and uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. So the FCC issued this order at the end of October, and this has been long coming. It had been announced months ago, and it was only through the appointment and a confirmation of Commissioner Gomez that there were three votes to vote this out. The two Republican commissioners strongly object to this initiative, saying it's illegal, primarily because of the concern that they're now getting into using e-rate funds to fund off-campus services. So this is all sort of a follow-on from the ECF program, which was um, enacted by Congress to respond to the COVID emergency, and that primarily funded um, equipment and services off campus to allow students and library patrons to access the internet during the emergency when buildings were shuttered. So what the FCC did in this um, order is um, they said the definition of educational purpose, which is the primary foundation upon which they um, allow services to be funded through E-rate. They've now said that though it, they've said all along that whatever activities are occurring on campus, on school and library property, have an educational purpose. And the definition of educational purpose for library is really to promote and to provide services to library patrons, but they use the same words, you know, educational purpose. So now what's new in this order is they've said the use of Wi-Fi on school buses is for an educational purpose. So once they made that determination, they're now saying that E-rate will fund school bus Wi-Fi. They're saying that it's critical to meeting ongoing educational needs of students, their ability to meaningfully engage in learning. There's lots of uh, data in the order to bolster this conclusion, finding how long students are spent on the buses and how much time they are um, that is being wasted by not having Wi-Fi available to do online classwork and schoolwork. And not notably, they're going to make this eligible beginning um, this current funding year. So as soon as the companion um, order that the uh, Bureau, the Wireline Competition Bureau, was directed to see comment on how to go about 
um, implementing this new initiative. That comment cycle is, uh, the comments are due on October, uh, November 30th. Then, and then there's reply comments, I think 15 days later, they'll come out with a uh, clarification or what's called an amendment to the eligible services list that hopefully are gonna provide some of these details. So here are the issues that cross over to the hotspot um, notice of proposed rulemaking, okay? And this is a preview of the next item that we're gonna talk about. What equipment and services qualify? So is it just the service, the monthly service costs, or is it also the equipment, you know, the routers that have to be installed in the buses to receive the Wi-Fi signal? How can they ensure that the purchase, uh, the equipment and the service costs are cost effective? So cost effective is the overriding standard for all E-rate purchases. They want the cost, they usually use competitive bidding as the means of making sure those purchases are cost effective, but they're asking what other measures are needed. They're also asking how much is this going to cost altogether? Um, because they're not 100% sure. They have data from the ECF program, but they really want to make sure they understand what the full cost is going to be. And are there measures that they ought to take to try to um, ensure that the overall demand for this for these new services basically doesn't break the bank, that it um, is within the allocated or approved amount that is the annual ceiling for E-rate funding. And then lastly, if the demand is over the amount of available funding, what would be the rules of priority? How would they decide who gets funded and for what? So um, those are kind of the key issues that then lend themselves into the hotspot item. And I'm gonna turn this over to Bob now. Okay, Deb, thank you very much for that summary on both the July notice and the, the bus notice. And as Deb noticed, the bus notice, especially in relationship to uh, funding uh, priorities, how much is this going to cost, has direct relevance to the hotspot uh, notice of proposed rulemaking because they ask for the most part the same questions there. Both of these initiatives, this on the hotspot lending and the bus initiative, are to provide services off campus. And as Deb said before, that gets into the whole issue of educational purpose that we'll touch on in just a quick minute here. So as I noted, uh, Jessica Rosenworcel actually announced this hotspot lending program at the ALA conference back in June in Chicago. And some people probably think, well, wow, why did it take until last week before they actually had this notice out the door? And that's because, as I mentioned before, the FCC lacked that uh, final fifth Democratic commissioner to push these through. So that just took a while until the political process got into play that allowed the FCC and Jessica Rosenworcel to get this out the door, if you will. So this, as Deb noted too, it really replaces the Emergency Connectivity Fund program. That fund is just about maxed out now. It was $7 billion. It sunsets at the end of June of 2024. So that's only, what, about seven, seven and a half months down the road. So the FCC, through Commissioner Rosenworcel, realized that you know something had to take place. We just aren't going to drop the fact that patrons and some students don't have access at home and how are they going to get it. So she's proposing to use E-rate, if you will, to extend the Emergency Connectivity Fund program for the most part. And there are a number of questions that they ask that they asked as part of the whole Emergency Connectivity Fund uh, process way back about two years ago, two and a half years ago when it got off the ground. Uh, one of which is, uh, as I noted here on the bullet point, should we adopt more stringent unmet needs? You know, one of the issues here with the emergency connectivity program is that, all right, you had to justify the fact, especially from a library perspective, that the patron didn't have internet access at home. And so they're asking, again, you know, how can we, the FCC, determine that? Or how, from the library perspective, can the library determine that? And one of the, the, the options that they're proposing is that libraries and schools do surveys of patrons or students, in the case of schools, to determine their unmet needs. And I think this is about the last thing that libraries want to get into. So certainly when ALA develops its comments, to the FCC, which is in the process now, we very much will push back against doing something of that nature. And then getting into the whole educational purpose that Deb has touched on a couple of times here already today, is that should the FCC require that the hotspots are used only for educational purposes? And this is a requirement that is not just in the regulations, but it's actually part 
of the 96 Telecommunications Act that set up the whole E-rate program. So one of the things that they have to do from an on-premises on the library or school property, as Deb said, everything's assumed to cover and be an educational purpose. But what happens once you get off school or library property, be it from the bus perspective or from this hotspot lending program? So one of the questions they ask is how can they assure that that patron that's going to be borrowing a hotspot device or a student is going to be using that for educational purposes. So this is a real issue that we'll probably have to address for the most part. And I, I noticed of interest, one of the things they touched on is uh, how can they ensure that these hotspots are not used for non-educational purposes like video games? So they just assume that I guess video games don't have any educational purpose at all. Uh, next slide, Deb. A couple of more questions in relationship, again, to the uh, the ECF program. Uh, they ask, as again, they uh, asked during the uh, ECF, is that should they require data really on the use of those hotspots by a particular time period? Should they require from an inventory perspective, uh, the model of the hotspot device, uh, the name, the serial number, and then more critically, especially from the library perspective, from the privacy point of view, uh, the name of the person that it's loaned to, uh, the dates of the loan, when it went out, when it came back in. And then they ask, and this is something kind of peculiar, I put it in uh, italics, they ask, should we consider library specific inventory rules? I'm not certain exactly what that means. And they provided no other information on that, on how they define library inventory needs. So I thought that was somewhat peculiar, but we'll have to uh, take a look at that. And then the final point on that uh, slide was, uh, the Children's Internet Protection Act, this again comes into play, and we're going to have to, again, push back against that because we don't want the Internet Protection Act to be uh, required for patron-owned devices or student-owned devices. So that's just a quick uh, coverage of some of the questions that they asked that are related to the ECF program. Uh, Deb, you want to take it over from the equipment proposals and some of the follow-up slides here? I do, and I apologize for operator error on the slide. <laughs> No it's just a hot mess. Okay, well, that's now recorded for prosperity. Um, equipment proposals and questions. So the proposals are, um, just to delineate, is kind of a breadcrumb that indicates what they're thinking and what they're likely to do. And when they ask questions, that is more of, well, they're covering the broad gamut of issues they're not quite sure what they want to do so they want to receive information and that information hopefully will inform them on making final decisions so what i think they're going to do is the proposal which says okay we're going to limit uh, so the definition of a wi-fi hotspot is going to be um, a device that receives mobile services, which is a more narrow definition than the ECF definition of hotspot, which is that it's capable of receiving advanced telecommunications and information services and sharing the services with another computer via Wi-Fi. Bob, you're going to need to decipher that for the group because technologically, I don't really understand the difference there but they're saying that this is a more narrow definition. Then they're also saying that in ECF, they allowed the hotspots to be a multi-user device. Here, they're saying the hotspot would just be an individual device, and it would not be a device that would be used by multiple users. Now, the questions they're asking is, well, should there be a limit that there's one per household or one per user? And that really relates primarily to what do you do when you've got more than one student in the same household? Do you have to assign a different device to each of those students or can one device meet the needs of multiple students? Then they're asking, well, um, should E-rate limit the funding of these devices? to make sure that if it was already, if they already, if the applicant already was funded for a device from ECF and that device is still in service and it has like a useful life of somewhere between three and five years, should we be funding new devices that are going to replace those old, those previously funded devices like prematurely? 
So that's kind of a cost containment measure that they're trying to figure out ways to make sure that they're not funding wasteful, you know, spending. And then the last question, which I think is really key, is they're saying, should we fund equipment at all or should we just limit this to the monthly service costs? And essentially the uh, funding for the equipment would either have to come from the school or library, um, you know, their local budget or another source. So uh, the next question is um, uh, for the proposal, um, they're proposing that they're going to fund the commercially available internet access service. So this is data plans for the individual hotspot use. Now they're getting into these details of, well, what do you do um, if we have the plans that are ongoing? So the monthly service costs are already being incurred for a device that we paid for through ECF. Should basically this new program only focus on the monthly service costs for ECF funded devices. So you'll see this theme throughout the NPRM where they're basically saying, well, should we really just kind of do a follow on from ECF or should we really open this new program up to all new hotspots for anyone that has can show that they have a patron or a student that has the need for the device? And then they're asking, well, what about services and equipment that are bundled in packages? Like, how do they handle that? And that's like more of a technical detail. And then and they're also asking, well, is there a minimum service level or service speed that should govern? Um, because I think they want to make sure that they're funding broadband and they're not funding, you know, narrowband services. Um, next, they want to know, and, and these are all questions about cost containment. They want to make sure that the purchases are going to be cost effective and reasonable. They want to know, do we need more safeguards besides competitive bidding and the fact that the school and library has to pay their non-discounted share? They, again, don't really know how much this program, this new program is going to cost. So they want to know what that's going to be, and they want to get... Um, actual cost data from schools and libraries that have already um, made these purchases. They want to know if they should set cost effective caps for services like they point to the affordable connectivity program where they have a cap that you can't get a subsidy of more than $30 a month or $75 for the more expensive areas in tribal areas. And they also want to know, well, what are we going to do to make sure that service providers keep their costs reasonably, you know, restrained, especially in those underserved areas? Note here that there's no proposals. They're just asking questions. But in my mind, this is a really key part of the um, of the document because they really want to make sure they understand what they're getting themselves into um, by making this proposal. They also have a lot of competitive bidding questions. And um, you'll see in my next uh, slide down the road, I think these questions are breadcrumbs and that they recognize that because of the limitations of these services, meaning that the service doesn't work in all areas because of the service coverage maps of the different cellular providers, they recognize that maybe competitive bidding model doesn't work here. They're also recognizing that service from one vendor may be needed for one bus route and service, uh, sorry, not a bus route, but for um, service for multiple vendors are going to be needed because a hotspot may not work in a student or library patron's home that's physically located in one geographic area, but a different company's service would work in a different library or student, uh, library patient or student's home. So the issue then becomes, well, are you going to fund these plans if they're, if the applicant asks for funding from two different service providers? Then they want to know, well, are there competitively bid state master contracts or national master contracts that applicants could buy off of? And that to me is a real tea leave kind of question because they're looking to see, are there existing mechanisms in place that might serve as a, um, as a uh, proxy for like an E-rate competitive bidding process? And then again, 
just like this one, just like the other air section, they're asking questions, but they have no particular proposals. But they're not done asking the cost questions. They want to know how much is this total initiative going to cost. They want to know what do they think based on the ECF data, um, whether those average costs are, are, re are a reasonable proxy for how much this is going to cost in, um, in the E-rate program. They want to know, again, should they have some kind of uh, provision for how many years the device has to be used in service before they'll fund a replacement device. And lastly, unlike ECF, where they had sort of a um, program of last resort that if you had no wireless service coverage or no even fixed um, you know, a wireline service option in a student's home, they authorize the build out, the infrastructure construction to make the service available in that um, area. They're basically saying here, no, we're not going to do that, but they make it a tentative conclusion and they ask for um, comment. They also ask whether or not there should be um, a, a, a provision to allow schools or libraries to extend their networks into the community when there's no commercially available service. Then they also want to know what rules of priority should be adopted. So what they want to know here is, should this all be considered category one service and not category two, where category two is capped, it's subject to the budget provision? Um, they, know, they say that the service itself would be category one, but this is really a question about, well, if we're going to fund the equipment, you know, the devices themselves, should that be category two? And then lastly, they want to know, well, what should we do if we don't have enough money for this? If the demand for this on top of existing category one and category two requests exceeds the annual funding cap, should we have a system of priority? And the questions they ask here is, you know, should hotspot um, requests for funding be funded last, you know, after the existing category one and category two requests? Should there be a prioritization to continue the service costs for the ECF funded devices? And should there be a specific aggregate cap just on the east uh, on the hotspot requests? And then lastly, they're asking, should we create a per student budget? Um, which is what they did for um, category two budgets for schools. I don't remember what they said about doing a library, you know, provision there, but the idea being that there would be a cost containment measure. So my personal observations here, they don't say what year this is going to go into effect, but if I were betting, Initially, I said there's no way they would get this done in time, but if there's a will, there's a way, and they may very much want to get this done sooner rather than later, especially with the politics in Washington being what they are, they may want to push this out and have this program embedded um, before the next election. I think there's some big lessons learned from ECF. You know, the compliance requirements for hotspots and for air cars are really pretty pretty strenuous, especially the, with this whole issue of having to prove that there's usage. And then um, what kind of proof is there going to have to be for lack of coverage in areas to justify multiple purchases from multiple vendors? And um, are they going to somehow want to synchronize these requirements with other um, USF programs to make sure that there's no duplicate funding requested. So let me turn this over now. Um, Bob, I think it's over to you now. Sure, Deb. Uh, thanks. Appreciate that uh, and those details as well. Uh, what I do want to cover just in a couple of minutes before we have a Q&A in the remaining time that we have is a cybersecurity pilot program that, again, just came out, I think, uh, late Monday or Tuesday of this week. So a lot of us haven't had a time to uh, thoroughly digest this. Uh, but I do want to know that uh, the comments on this one, I think Deb had mentioned also on the hotspot lending device, uh, first have to wait as far as the deadline are concerned until they're published in the Federal Register. And as far as I know, at least as of yesterday, neither of these I had been published in the Federal Register yet. So it does give us some time once they're published in the Federal Register. There's a 30-day uh, comment period, and then there's more time for reply comments. So we do have some time on this. Uh, next slide, Deb. 
So some of the key questions that they ask on the pilot program, uh, and I think as I noted on that one before, there's what, 222 questions that they ask. So I didn't have room on this slide for all 222, but I did put a couple of them down. Uh, one of which is they are proposing to collect to $200 million. And this is separate from the E-rate. You know, the E-rate is capped at about $4.7 billion. Now the annual demand is about $2.9 billion, but they don't want to you take while there's plenty of space in that demand that's not being used, they don't want to take it out of the E-rate. So they will be taking it out of the Universal Service Fund, but it'll be a separate bucket of money, if you will. But they're asking if that's going to be sufficient because they proposed this to cover the three-year period, which would roughly mean about what 66, 67 million dollars would be spent every year. One of the questions they also ask is, well, should we shorten this three-year pilot program? I do want to digress for just a second to note that many groups, including, excuse me, SICA, Shelby, uh, Funds for Learning, ALA, uh, have strongly proposed uh, over the last couple of years, this is not a new issue on cybersecurity, that robust, comprehensive cybersecurity tools be fully eligible for the E-Ray program. And personally, I'm a little bit disappointed that what they did is instead of make them eligible, like they likely will do with a hotspot lending program, they created this pilot program. Frankly, I don't need think we need a pilot program to determine the need of cybersecurity tools and our school and library networks. I think the need is already obvious, but again, this is what we're dealing with at this point in time. So one of the recommendations that all of our groups had for the most part is, okay, you from the FCC perspective, if you're going to be doing this pilot program, we think one year is more than sufficient to find out you know, what exactly is needed, what exactly the threats are from the cybersecurity perspective. There's no need to you know, push this down the road three years. Uh, so again, we'll have to see what happens in our comments, uh, but we'll certainly press for the one year uh, coverage instead of three years. And the other thing they're concerned about from a cost perspective is they point out in a couple of areas that our library is able to leverage or use other funds that are out there. Maybe some states have uh, state funding they can use. Maybe in certain instances, uh, IMLS funding from the library point of view can be used. Maybe there's federal Department of Education funding on the K-12 side. Uh, so they're encouraging libraries and schools, obviously, to look at other sources of funding because they will not be able to depend on the E-rate to cover this cybersecurity, at least for the next few years, the way things look. Uh, they ask about what equipment and services should, should be funded. And, uh, and I think another key area here is they are concerned, uh, and rightly so, I think, to ensure that from this pilot program point of view, they have a wide variety of libraries and schools applying. And related to that, is the final point here is, you know, how can they work with applicants that don't have the experience, they don't have the staff to really ensure that their networks are secure? And I think uh, they reference in the notice that, uh, you know, should we, the FCC, direct USAC to provide some handholding in this area? And certainly from the ALA common point of view, we're going to say absolutely. We do want smaller libraries and smaller school districts to be able to apply for this pilot program and to be selected. We just don't want you know, the larger ones in urban areas that have the time to fill out the application. They have the expertise on staff to deal with cybersecurity issues. We need to have smaller libraries and schools involved and selected as part of this. So just to briefly, there's an application process, a separate form that's going to be developed by the FCC or by USAC where uh, libraries and schools can apply. There's a 60-day open period once this application becomes available. And then 90 days after that, the, after that, if you will, the FCC will make their determination on you know, who the winners are in this program. So I see this, uh, you know, Deb was talking about timing from the hotspot lending program. I'm not certain there's too much of a hurry about this. It doesn't really uh, revolve around you know the deadlines for the 470 or 471 necessarily. So this may easily be pushed off into later 2024. Uh, so that's uh, brief comments on some of the key areas and some of the key issues that we have to deal with over the next a couple of months to get our comments into the FCC on the school bus comment deadlines coming up pretty soon. And then, like I said, the comment period on the hotspots and the cybersecurity pilot program are still pending, depending on when they get published in the Federal Register. So Don, I'll turn it back over to you. I think we have a little bit of time here for maybe questions that folks have. Uh, I, I'm sure there are. <laughs> if their heads are spinning like mine is, they certainly do. Uh, what I'm struck most by is the level of complexity that already exists in the program 
has is just ramped up with these uh, additions and changes. The complexity of off campus, whatever that means, is really profound in terms of being able to articulate uh, appropriate and manageable, uh, administratable uh, regulations. Uh, you folks are unbelievably uh, dedicated to this. I, I know a lot of people have built entire careers just trying to understand and, and, and help uh, end users, libraries and schools, uh, cope with these challenges. Is, is there any hope for simplification in the in the process of these rules? Can well, they can they be simplified? Well, that gets back to uh, Deb's coverage of the July uh, notice and some of the simplification proposals that the FCC hopefully will adopt. And I'd like to see some of those come out in time for the July first, two thousand twenty four application year. I'm not certain we will. But, you know, some of those certainly will be helpful, but I'm, you know, a little bit concerned, well, more than a little bit concerned in relationship, especially the hotspot lending program. We saw a lot of concern from the ECF program where a fair number of libraries didn't apply because of the complexity of the program. Uh, something I alluded to in my slide, the whole privacy issue. Uh, you know, we, from the ALA perspective, uh, had some conversations with the FCC staff over the summer months before this NPRM was released just last week. You know, telling them that, you know, why would a patron come into a library and request a hotspot if he or she already had Internet access at home? You know, is that really necessary? And the staff basically said, well, yeah, you know, that, that probably doesn't make much sense. You know, why would they do that? So why should we, the FCC, require that? But when you look at the questions they ask and the tenor of the questions in the context that they're placed, they certainly are looking at, you know, requiring that again, that you, you know, poke that patron when he or she comes up to the desk, make them sign a form saying that they don't have internet access at home. And as I noted in that one slide, uh, if you give them that hotspot device, they'll use it only for educational purposes. You know, that's not yeah. going to help, uh, you know, encourage libraries to apply. I think they're making the program really complex. And for schools alone, I don't know how viable this program is going to be because for hotspots because they're the onerous requirements of the unmet need, plus the whole idea that you have to have usage. And I don't know exactly how that's going to have a bearing on um, the, the libraries. Uh, and how you uh, are going to justify how many devices that you're going to use and put in circulation for for the loan program. Uh, I think those things are very onerous. And, and also the idea that they're now asking questions about whether SIPA would govern um, and have to be uh, applicable to these devices. I think that's a huge issue for libraries. And then lastly, um, how are you going to ensure that you keep the asset inventory. You know, Bob asked that question, you know, do you need separate inventory rules? And why couldn't you just have a splash screen or some kind of sign-in screen that says by accessing this device, you confirm that you have a need to use this device, you know, and that you will use it for a purpose, you know, a legitimate purpose consistent with the library's mission or something like that. You know, to me, those are the things that um, would be much simpler to streamline it and to make it more accessible to the, to the libraries. Right, and I could add again on the whole uh, Children's Internet Protection Act, I, I mentioned that very briefly in one of the slides. Uh, for years, the ALA has taken the position that that only applies to library-owned computers. So if a patron brings in a laptop or a tablet into the library and uses the library's Wi-Fi, that does not have to be filtered. And for years, the FCC never commented on that ALA position until the Emergency Connectivity Fund program came out. And then they actually made that acknowledgement in that order that patron-owned devices or uh, student-owned devices from a school perspective don't have to be filtered. So that was great news. We finally made progress on that. But now coming back into their proposal here, they're asking the question, well, how can we prevent uh, non-educational use? How can we prevent... Uh, you know, students or patrons getting access to, you know, questionable material, maybe we should require uh, filters on those personally owned devices. So that would be a big step backwards that we're going to have to push against. For sure. Uh, it, it sounds like the complexity is compounded, not just by the difficulty of, of administration, 
but by the potential to uh, be used politically, that these things can be made to describe, can be described in such a way that is, you know, sort of detrimental to the to the whole process. That it's, uh, uh, you know, we 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 didn't think libraries were controversial politically, but so, suddenly they are. It's nothing can escape the the ability to be politicized. And so I feel that just must be in the heads of the, of the FCC commissioners is how this all sounds or how could it be interpreted and how somebody could, could misrepresent these, uh, these circumstances, which are, you know, just aimed at, at supporting uh, learning. Um, the, is, is part of the problem that, that uh, E-rate, treats both these institutions the same or they try to or are they trying to shoehorn libraries into being schools is that is that part of what creates this issue i don't think so i think it is primarily the children's internet protection act and mm. the requirement and the legal distinction they're trying to determine whether the hotspot constitutes a computer that would be a library owned computer somehow that would require the filtering all along you know ALA has had a very strong presence on the first amendment issue etc and to the extent that um, you you raise the question are the needs of students different than the needs of library patrons yeah they are, yet you have the one law that governs both of them. And I think that is where the FCC is trying to thread the needle. So and I think, yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah, good point, Deb. And if I could take somewhat of a 30,000 foot level, you know, from a school perspective, schools do want to know what students are doing in relationship to their access to the internet, especially when they're in the school building, because they're going to be using that internet access for school related purposes. The opposite point of view is from the library perspective, libraries really don't want to know from a First Amendment perspective what patrons are doing unless they're obviously doing something totally unlawful. Uh, so that's where you have this big divide. And it, I think it's been difficult for the ALA to convince the FCC that there is this difference there. But if I can take just a quick second, Don, and maybe comment from your political perspective. I had on slide 10 uh, that comment from Commissioner Symington, one of the Republican comments who said, uh, the E-rate for hotspots is even more lawless and wasteful than the Wi-Fi and bus proposal. So obviously he was not a supporter of this, but there are questions when you look at both the bus proposal and the Wi-Fi proposal, hotspot proposal, where the FCC in numerous areas is asking for comments on, do we have the legal authority to say that a patron's household or a student household is actually a classroom? Because when you look at the language of the law, it refers to, especially from the school perspective, uh, you know, E-rate discounts are to be used for school classrooms. So you have to take a somewhat liberal point of view in relationship to that definition and say, you know, learning takes place outside of the classroom now. And that's been a big issue for uh, Chair Rosenworcel for any number of years. We can't just look at a classroom from the 1995 perspective when the uh, telecom law was passed. Things have changed dramatically since then. But I'll also note that, you know, Congress has come into play on this. Senator Cruz back in late uh, July sent a letter to uh, Chair Rosenworcel complaining about the hotspot proposal that was you know, released or noticed at ALA and uh, about how this was, you know, uh, way out and left field someplace. It makes no sense. It's a misuse of the E-rate funds. And, uh, you know, the commissioner sent back a, a nice letter to their good senator, you know, rebutting all of his concerns. But certainly there are, uh, you know, political concerns, concerns about these off-campus uses that transcend just the opposition from a couple of FCC commissioners. Right. Well, that that kind of longstanding, I don't know if you actually call it a debate or back and forth anyway, was just superseded by the pandemic. I mean, we were we were thrown into these solutions because we had to do something. There was sim there were the schools were closed. So does that mean there's no school? Well, no, we had to find a way and we had the technology at hand to do it, but it had to be expanded through these through these mechanisms. Um, we're we're running over a few minutes. We start a few minutes late. I, I hope you have some time to stay with us. We're not this is like, like a TV show, so we don't have a rigid timetable, but we want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, uh, I'm looking for questions. I'm seeing a lot of compliments, but 
not particular questions. The one, the one I had about uh, the security was, is really interesting. This has just come up recently, right? Uh, and so, the small institutions, small libraries, are not are not even really in independent. They're they're departments of small city county government, and that you know they. They don't have independent IT staff. They don't have the capability to deal with these kinds of firewall issues. But yet, these governments are being challenged by this. So, it, are, are, is the whole city government going to be able to utilize these funds to protect all the agencies, one of which is the library? Well, that's a good point, uh, Don, because uh, that does vary from library to library. You know, some libraries are totally independent with totally separate uh, you know, governance processes and totally separate networks from a technical perspective. So therefore, you know, they're free, if you will, of any uh, municipality or county uh, government uh, being kind of the umbrella organization from the networking perspective. But then in other instances, you're exactly right. They are part of the uh, municipal network along with the parks department, the police department, the fire department. And so therefore, uh, they are beholden upon a higher level of networking expertise from the municipal government to be able to, you know, uh, use some of these funds. And I do know in some instances, just in the E-rate in general, that's one of the reasons some libraries don't apply because they say, oh, really, the city's paying for our E-rate. We never really, really even, or excuse me, our internet access. We never really even see a bill. So they just, you know, don't pay much attention to it. And just a quick sidebar comment, you know, me being in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, you know, most of our libraries, probably 80, 85 percent of our 383 libraries uh, don't filter at all. So they aren't going to be eligible for this. They just have a strong First Amendment uh, point of view. They don't want to you know, comply with the Children's Internet Protection Act. So that takes them off the plate. That uh, that that does simplify things. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of libraries take take that approach, understandably, uh, on you know, it maybe it's just a mix of of uh, of uh, rights of privacy and complexity. You know the hassle of yeah. doing it uh, combined. But uh, uh, let's. Uh, I, I'm just not seeing anything that looks like a question um, that I can identify there. Uh, Kaji was talking about filtering. Hot spots on group. Oh, by the way, yes, yesterday Shelby had a had a, a session. Uh, Shelby is a great go to on this as a as a way to aggregate a whole lot of input and output. The communication flows both ways from D.C. through that organization in a place where schools and libraries do come together to talk about common issues. It, it's kind of one of the foundational attributes of the organization. Uh, uh, and it came up about uh, school buses and that there was no way to separate an onboard uh, receiver, transceiver, <clears throat> that was both receiving a cell signal and transmitting a Wi-Fi signal, uh, that it was one unit, you know, two radios, but inside of one unit. And, and, and whether it was category one or category two was just not, you know, not uh, uh, possible to, to separate it. Uh, I, I don't know if that applies to these off-campus devices. We've always wondered about sustainability on that. I mean, okay, if everybody signs a form, fine. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, who, well, I who think returns these? That's my, that's my question, Bob. Who, who, who gives these back in these checkout hotspots? I mean, why would you ever return it unless they just turned it off? If you didn't, and do they well that that's possible but uh, you know you you couldn't say the same thing in relationship to any of the materials that are checked out by the library oh i mean there are libraries now you know not using federal funds at all that have wi-fi hotspots that do check them out to patrons for a, a two-week or a 30-day period uh you know which i guess is better than no internet access at all if that patron is looking at applying for jobs or trying to get federal disability benefits or whatever it might happen to be but that's just a you know i view hotspots as you know, somewhat of a Band-Aid approach, if you will, or a limited approach, yeah. because ultimately we have to look, I think, at that federal, especially the bead funding from NTIA as addressing this whole issue of the 
uh, you know, several million of households out there that don't have internet access at all. So this is hotspots loaning as, is not the solution. It's kind of a bridge program until we can finally get that connectivity uh, out to those uh, households that don't have it, either because of uh, economic reasons or simply the network isn't available in rural areas. I think there's also well, a recognition well, yeah. that with the affordable connectivity plan being maxed out and that ending, um, this will absolutely be a bridge for the families that don't have internet, wired internet at home. And to me, the challenge here is to look at this from the high perspective, you know, from the 50,000 foot perspective and not get bogged down by all of these, you know, regulatory questions and say, okay, what's the framework? What makes sense here? And then enact the safeguards um, around that, yeah. as opposed to being sort of like worried about, you know, the criticism and then putting all these layers of bureaucracy on. And then by the time you look at the program, you realize that it's just toppling over from all the regulatory requirements. You know, that's a good point. Also, Deb mentioned well, the affordable connectivity program, which is going to expire very soon, uh, probably the end of the first quarter or second quarter of this next year. And there are, I think, 22 million households that are now using those funds. Uh, I think there's what $14 billion that was allocated for that. Of interest, when Deb had mentioned before in one of her slides about the concern that the FCC has on the hotspot loan program about duplicative funding, there is a section in there that says, well, if a family is receiving the affordable connectivity program discount, you could have a student in that family still getting a hotspot, but how can we be assured that the parent of that student isn't then using that hotspot for internet connectivity. And then they get into all of these uh, questions on, like I said before, well, if the parents have discounts through the ACP, maybe they aren't going to be using the student's hotspot. And it's like, how, how would you possibly be able to police that or manage that sort of thing? So uh, yeah, it gets uh, complex very, uh, very fast. Very, of course, very it might quickly. not be yes, an issue that... or it might be moot if there's no more funding for the ACP. Well, the context here, I would say, is universal service, universal service. That's everybody. The history of universal service says that if a service is deemed essential or basic, then everyone should have affordable access to it. We did that with water, with electricity and telephone, but not with broadband, not with the Internet access. That At that point, it became, you know, just like Intel and Cisco where private companies will invest where we expect return. And it is just spun out from there uh, having to do all this band-aid work and backfill to, to actually reach what we've all or had committed to as a society that, that everyone should have access, affordable access to this essential service. So uh, there we are, here we are in, in this thing. So let's close here with, uh, with a, a, a final comment. Uh, Deb, something, I mean, that was great, but do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I have nothing pithy uh, to add other than um, I had a really fundamental experience um, a couple of years ago when I happened to be in Boston um, visiting my daughter. And I went to the Boston Public Library and I was actually using the E-rate funded application to fill out the South Dakota state network application. And to me, the com the libraries are community centers. And in t and less than until the policymakers re recognize that, I think there's going to be these barriers to trying to get these policies m streamlined to make that um, uh, easier to achieve. Well said, beautifully said. Uh, you know, libraries is a is a, is a last resort for many people. I mean, there has to be some floor to this uh, to these services that that we won't allow people to drop through. Bob, final word. Sure. I think uh, from the ALA perspective, first of all, uh, we will not be filing comments in relationship to the Wi-Fi on buses because it's not really in our wheelhouse for the most part. It's fine for the schools to go ahead and do so. On the uh, Wi-Fi hotspot lending program, I'll be looking at the comments that we filed about two years ago, two and a half years ago on the ECF, because I have a feeling many of those comments are going to be relevant for this particular notice as well, especially pushing again to simplify things as much as possible. 
so that those smaller libraries can apply and take advantage of that program. And some, same thing, I think fewer libraries are going to be interested in the cybersecurity pilot program. But again, we certainly want to see a, a fair number of smaller libraries and smaller communities be able to apply for that and encourage uh, the FCC to put the uh, uh, pressure on USAC to provide that level of service, just like we have been trying to get the FCC to put the pressure on USAC to have more outreach from the ERA perspective and more training sessions. We need that for the smaller applicants. Completely agree. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to thank our speakers, Bob Boker and Deborah Creedy for these outstanding presentations, so much detail, so many questions. Uh, but we know you're you're working on it, and and I think we all feel more confident, uh, somewhat more confident that that that's going to uh, uh, make a difference, and that uh, in, in fact we'll have an improved system here, uh, even as we have sort of the advantage of uh, uh, sympathetic commissioners on the commission. So with that, we will uh, end recording and sign off. So okay, thank you, Don. Thank you. I have that. Laura. Okay.